For more than a century, Central Baptist Church in downtown Noonan, Georgia has been keeping house for God. During that over 110 years, Central Baptist has served not only its members, but its community as well. Worship has always been a primary focus of the life of Central Baptist Church. Since God gave us His best and His only begotten Son, we feel compelled to give God our best. From the way we dress to the music we sing, we realize we are in a holy place when we're in God's house. Now, let's worship the Lord as we join this past Sunday's worship service already in progress. wonderful to see you in worship this morning. Express appreciation to many of you who came early and were part of the congregational dialogue. And uh, it's also good to now to come in and take a deep breath and just relax and uh, worship together. It's a beautiful first day of a new week. Yesterday, uh, Katie Brady called me to share with me the fact that Miss Margaret Glover uh, fell and uh, injured herself. She will be 106 on the 30th day of December. She's our oldest member, just an indomitable kind of personality, wonderful, wonderful lady. So we're praying for her recovery, of course. On Wednesday of this week, during our 6.30 time, uh, we'll be welcoming Shane McNary. He's a CBF uh, missions personnel uh, we used to call them missionaries uh, to the Czech Republic, and he'll be sharing with us work that is being done in that part of the world. And again, it's wonderful to be together for worship and pray that we'd now be able to focus our minds and our hearts on God's presence among us and that we'll experience the inspiration and guidance that only God can give.
Please join me in the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on the Lord's name. Make his deeds known to all the people. For the Lord our God is faithful to a thousand generations. Sing praises to the Lord. Tell of the Lord's wonderful works and glory in his holy name. for God and for God's strength. Let those who seek the Lord rejoice. For the Lord, our God, is faithful to a thousand generations. Let us pray. Merciful God, we gather together to offer you our praise and thanksgiving for the unfailing love you have shown us generation after generation. You alone are God, and we are your people. We pray that your Holy Spirit move among us as we worship. Open our hearts and minds to see you at work, encouraging, challenging, and uplifting each one of us. May our worship bring honor and glory to you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. of the litany. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Praise the Lord and most worthy of praise. God's greatness is unsearchable. One generation will commend your works to another and declare your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. The Lord is just in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. The Lord fulfills the desire of all who fear him. The Lord hears their cry and saves them. 
The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. Praise the Lord, and bless thou holy name. join me in the front. You're sitting in my seat. Good morning. Oh, wow. Did you bring a lamb in here? All right. All right. Raise your hand if you've ever done something that was very hard to do. And maybe you got a little frustrated when, it, when you were trying to do it. Like maybe tying your shoe. Yeah, you've been trying hard to do that. Or getting yourself dressed. Or writing your name. Or reading a book. All those things could make you a little frustrated if you don't know how to do it. But what do you have to do? Just keep working on it, right? Just keep trying and keep trying and learn. That's right. Even if it makes you frustrated. Our story today is um, from 2 Thessalonians. All my first and second graders, we learned that book of the Bible the other day, didn't we? Thessalonians, yeah? Paul wrote the letter to the people of Thessalonica. That's a crazy name of a town, isn't it? It's like calling us Noonanites, Thessalonica. The Thessalonians. Those are funny names, aren't they? Yeah. So Paul wrote the, the letter to those people, and he was telling them not to be frustrated. They were very frustrated because, you know what? They were the very first people to ever follow Jesus, to be Christian. And they were just so frustrated because they didn't know what to do. They didn't understand what that meant. Before that, a lot of them were Jewish. And they were, are you trying to pull my hair? <laughs> and they were trying to understand what the difference was. So they were getting really frustrated. So um, Paul was telling them, don't worry. Don't be frustrated. No matter what happens, God will stand by you. Okay? So God will always be there. So don't get frustrated no matter what. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, didn't we? God always loves you. Okay? Let's pray. Lord. Thank you for always being in our hearts. We know that your spirit is with us through all that we do. Help us to always remember this so that when we get frustrated in life, we can remember to call on your help. Amen. Just as Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, we send emails back and forth with our sister church, Fellowship Baptist Church in Naren Hall, Matanzas, Cuba. And this church will be our focus for our corporate prayer um, and worship today. It's been our tradition over the last decade to pray for our sister church and their pastor, Tony Santana. Not only will Tony be visiting us in just a matter of weeks, but we're looking to possibly visit his church again in February of next year. There'll be information about this in the challenge in the newsletter. Tony has sent us an update on their congregation. They've recently celebrated five <coughs> baptisms, including the baptism of Tony's daughter, Same. They ask for prayer for Ernesto Perez and Liliette, both who are overcoming some health issues and they also ask us to pray for the construction development 
on the new property that they're working on. This property was purchased after our visit last February. Basically, they doubled the size of their church property and the church building. So um, they are in the process of doing some construction work to expand their sanctuary, and so they asked for prayers for um, that, those efforts. So as we pray, I encourage you to think of Tony and our sisters and brothers in Cuba who continue to share life together day by day. Continue to pray for them knowing that they continue to pray for us as well. And we've been trying to send needs of this congregation to Tony so that uh, they can also pray for us. Let us join now in prayer. Holy One, while we celebrate the freedom and luxuries we have in our comfortable lives, too often we fail to remember those in other parts of the world who are without the same liberties. This morning, we specifically remember our friends in Cuba who are serving under the fraternity of Baptist churches. We pray for Fellowship Baptist Church in Matanzas, and their continued work in their community and their country. Specifically, we remember Liliette, Ernesto, the continued construction of the church, and for Tony Santana's leadership. There are certainly other partners around the world who are also on our minds, like the work of the Good Samaritan Hospital in La Romana, Dominican Republic, and the numerous CBF missionaries who continue to be supported and stay in relationship with this congregation. Continue to help us be grateful for the opportunities that we have in our own community, and help us continue to demonstrate love and compassion for those around our world who face life without the chance of education, health care, and basics needed to live each day. Finally, we join with your followers around the world by praying as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
our day today, and thank you for all these wonderful people. Thank you for everything we have. <coughs> help these tithes and offerings to go to those who need help. Please continue our blessings. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 13 through 17. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The persons whom I lead in worship, among whom I counsel, visit, pray, preach, and teach, want shortcuts. So says Eugene Peterson, the Presbyterian minister best known for his paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. In a challenging book which he wrote titled A Long Obedience, Peterson notes the impact of an instant society on contemporary Christianity. We're so accustomed, he wrote, to eight-minute pizzas Oil changes while you wait, drive up flu shots, money available from a machine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that we also want a point and click method for Christian living. In such a world, when somebody offers five steps to a great marriage or three keys to more effective praying, are the secret of the victorious Christian life, available in DVD for, of course, a suitable donation, phone lines are jammed. Trouble is, he reminds us, never has there been in the first century down through to the 21st century any shortcuts, no easy formulas for the lives we're called to live as followers of Jesus Christ. Bob Dietz, a veteran pastoral counselor in the United Methodist Church, describes the healthy way of handling bereavement work as doing grief work. It is painful and shattering and anxious, and it cannot be rushed. It takes Time. He estimates that it takes two or three years to work through significant grief. Dietz tells the story of Irene, who thought there was a quicker way to come to terms with the death of her husband. And Irene told Dr. Dietz that she was going to tackle her grief work with all her faculties. She would do all the right things and get through her grief faster than anyone could imagine. And Dr. Dietz reports that she did attack her grief work. She did the right things so that she could possibly get through her grief more quickly than others. She permitted herself to cry openly She did not hold back how she felt when she met with her counselor and talked with family and friends about how she really felt and the sense of emptiness and loss that some days were nearly overwhelming. Nevertheless, writes Pastor Dietz, 
when she felt her recovery was nearly complete, two years and nine months had gone by. The process just cannot be rushed. One of the most memorable incidents from World War II occurred in 1940. Britain was in a precarious position. Belgium, <coughs> Holland, France had all fallen. But Britain evacuated the forces at Dunkirk and bravely fought on. The following year, Winston Churchill stood in front of the students at Harrow School in Northwest London, which by the way has been in existence since 1242. It has quite a re reputation for stick to and Churchill himself is a graduate of Barrow School. So after the brunt of the war was over, he stood before his alma mater and said to those young men, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. Churchill had learned from personal experience the value of persistence and endurance and patience of keeping on, keeping on to get through to the other side. The Apostle Paul, in his writing to the Thessalonians, speaks in our text for today, our lectionary reading for today, not of instant solutions but of long-term endurance, of staying the course, being careful and diligent. And he urges them in verse 15, as you heard read a few moments ago by Dr. Nance, stand firm, hold fast. We're reminded yet again by the apostle that we should make no mistake about it. Christianity is more than writes a passage more than che checking in for sacred occasions such as baby dedications and baptisms and marriage and the inevitable funeral. As important as those are, they're not all there is to the Christian faith. Sometimes we jokingly <coughs> refer to the pastor's task as to hatch, match, and dispatch. And of course we laugh about it, but there are some people who think that's all it's about for the pastor. But we all need to recover the notion of discipleship. Discipleship of the Christian life is a long time, lifelong apprenticeship to Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul describes the Christian way of life as something very different from just trying to discover simple formulas or quick fixes that really those do not square with what faith is really all about. Even emotionally moving mountaintop experiences are not enough. The Christian life is a pilgrimage. It is a journey. And I do not mean to say that it's drudgery. That's not it at all, but it is a process that takes a lifetime. In fact, our scripture goes on to say it goes on beyond a lifetime. A few weeks ago, we talked on Wednesday nights about heaven. One of the things we noted is we don't know all about heaven or what we'll be doing all the time, but one of the things that scripture, one of the things that scripture is consistent about is we will keep on growing and we'll keep on developing as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life is a pilgrimage, a journey. It's filled with a lot of joy, but requires a lot of discipline as well. Eugene Peterson took the title of the book that I mentioned earlier in the sermon from a statement by none other than Friedrich Nietzsche, the 19th century German philosopher Although Nietzsche could hardly be described as a classic example of Christianity, he did, in fact, helpfully write that what is needful for believers 
is a long obedience in the same direction. He's right. We need long obedience, steady endurance, stick to staying with our growth and our development. He reminds us that we also need to recover a sense of the classic disciplines of the Christian life. Regular prayer, regular Bible study, regular worship, regular obedience, and bearing a witness to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever we work or live or play, engaging in these disciplines day in and day out, over the decades and ultimately over our lifetime, enable us to gradually become more and more like Jesus Christ. One of the things I have encountered over the years is people want to be mature in the faith and fully grown in the faith before they go through the disciplines and the time that is required to become that person who is mature and exhibits the life of Christ. More like the saints among us, we might say. But we need to be reminded also that the foundation for endurance, for Christian staying power, is not better resolve, more motivation, trying harder to do the right things. It is instructive that Paul writes in our text for today not of human performance, but of divine grace. God's unmerited favor given to us as the foundation for your life and my life as a Christian. He notes in verse 13, for example, that God made the first move when God chose you. God took the initiative in drawing us to him. We did not decide. I think it's a good idea that I respond to God's love, God's grace, God's gift of salvation. It was God who chose us, who reached out to us. And God not only chose you, he goes on to say, but also sanctified you, which is a highfalutin <laughs> theological word that simply means he makes it possible for you to become holy to become sinless over a period of eternity. God gives us the ability to grow in faith and become more like Christ. And then there's that verse 14 to which I alluded a moment ago. The ultimate goal is yet to come when you and I, as he says in the latter part of verse 14, Share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in eternity. Every one of these aspects of Christian discipleship is grounded in grace. God's gift of undeserved favor. We do nothing to earn God's favor. God extends his favor to us and gives us the ability to respond to the call to salvation and then gives us the stick to to keep on growing and keep on becoming like Jesus Christ. There are some passages in the scripture that I think are unparalleled in beauty in the old King James. I like a lot of the newer versions, of course. Every Sunday I use the new Revised Standard Version. We have in the Pew Bibles, the, the living, excuse me, the, help me out. What is it, Ann? NIV, yes, thank you. The new international version. I applaud the many different versions. I have, I don't know how many on my shelf. I remember one day years ago when we were in Chattanooga, and I, the children had come to see where the pastor has his office. And I had a shelf of books that were probably about six feet tall that had different translations. And uh, one of the young boys, about eight or nine years of age, was admiring them. And I said, well, I'm glad you do. My wife told me if I bought one more version of the Bible, she was going to climb the walls. 
And a few weeks later, I announced in church about a new translation that I'd gotten. And he remembered and came up to me at the end of the service. Did your wife climb the wall this way? <laughs> <coughs> All that diversion is to say I applaud the many translations of Scripture. But there are some that are classic for King James. I like, for example, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the Christian life, a long obedience, a lifestyle, a lifetime, of dying to self-centeredness and self-directedness and gradually over a lifetime living to the inspiration of God's Spirit. I remind us all that this is not an autonomous project. We cannot do this in our own power. It is a Christ-centered task which happens as we participate in the life of Christ and we allow Christ to participate in our life. It is through Christ, the one who died and who now lives, that we carry out our mission as Christians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 has Paul saying it this way, it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. God gives us the desire to do God's will and God gives us the ability to do God's will so that over a lifetime and even into eternity we become more and more like Christ. Part of the beauty of what I'm sharing with you from God's word this morning is that God always gives what God asks of us. Therefore, Paul concludes this exhortation that we're looking at today with a prayer in verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us through grace, gave us eternal comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and in every good word. The bottom line is no matter what you are going through, you can survive. No matter how hopeless you may feel life is today, you can survive. No matter how bleak things may look to you, you can get to the other side because, because God stands by you to strengthen you and God wishes to live through you, through his spirit, to encourage you and to strengthen you and to guide you, to not just give you hope for someday, somewhere in the by and by, but God wishes to encourage you step by step, day by day, week after week, decade after decade, for a lifetime, all through eternity. Because God stands by you, you will get to the other side. In 1905, Charles Albert Tenley, the great African-American hymn writer, penned these lines. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Most of us know that Elvis Presley popularized this gospel song when he arranged it and recorded it in his own personal, passionate way that only Elvis could do. But it was Tenley who first wrote this stirring song. He is known till today as the founding father of American gospel music. He was the son of a slave. His mother was not a slave, but he was. 
So technically, he was a free man, but he lived in a slave world. He taught himself to read and write when he was 17 years of age. He was a driven young man, working as a janitor in a small church while attending night school. He earned his divinity degree through a correspondence course. And in 1902, he became the pastor of the Calvary Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. The church he had served as a janitor, and at that time it had 130 members. At the time of Tenless' death in 1933, the church had 12,500 members, and it continues to thrive in the city of <coughs> Philadelphia. The Tenley Temple United Methodist Church named after him. He knew firsthand what it meant for God to stand beside him. He knew firsthand what it was like to overcome the odds. He knew what it was like to be ostracized and made fun of. He knew firsthand of what he wrote when the storms of life are raging. Stand by me. Stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can, And my friends, misunderstand. Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing chilly Jordan, O oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. It is true. It is absolutely true. When you're going, going through a difficult time, when you don't see much hope, <clears throat> When you're fighting to keep your head above the water and just about to go down for the third time, when you're absolutely convinced nobody understands you or what you're dealing with, when it seems that respect has literally gone out the window, there is one who is always faithful and utterly reliable. He will come alongside you to lift you up. He will comfort your heart, and he will strengthen you in every good work. Therefore, never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. God's word for us today is God stands beside us. Never, never give in. Amen. In a moment, we'll be led to sing our departing hymn. And if there are decisions you'd like to share, like becoming a member of this church or confessing your faith in Christ, or some other decision you'd like to share, I'll be here to receive whatever conversation you wish. 
And I also recognize that where you stand or sit, there are also decisions that you may make that are just as important as any public decision you might wish to make. I just want us to never forget that there is one who stands beside us. So let us go the whole route. Let us not give up. We will get to the other side, whatever it is we're facing. For God stands beside us. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to worship with you, and I pray that you'll experience God's presence with you all the days of your lives. Earlier at the end of our congregational dialogue, uh, I misspoke to some of our transition team leadership. I said, you just put these completed sheets on the piano, and we'll deal with those Tuesday. Well, then I begin to have other transition team people say, we want to take them home and go ahead and assimilate those. So if you did not get your set of materials from your table, if you would go to the pastor's office and go to the workroom in the back, Carol will be there to make sure that you get. <laughs> Was that subtle or what? <laughs> She'll help you get your set of sheets. Many of you did that, so I apologize for giving mixed signals there. I was trying to be nice to those of you who did not get it, but it also would be very helpful if you could do the synthesizing by Tuesday, but if you can't, then that's fine as well. Thank you all again for being a part of worship. Let's now close with our benediction. I pray now that the God of peace, the God of comfort, the God of care, not only be with you, but that you may experience the love, the peace, the joy, the security that only God in Christ can provide. And I encourage you to savor this moment of silence before returning to a world that is filled with noise.